Hey Optimancers, Chris here. I've been thinking a lot about the Armor of Agathis spell. I went in detail over this spell in my last video, which I'll link up above if you haven't seen it. But to sum up, Armor of Agathis is a pretty good spell. But it could be a great spell if you find the way to have the damaging portion of the spell trigger multiple times. Not just great as a first level spell, but great with higher level slots as well. One of the primary challenges to deal with, though, is Armor of Agathis only does damage to creatures that hit you with a melee attack. And if you're damaged in other ways, this will degrade or even remove the spell, and it won't deliver any damage. So what I wanted to do was to devote a video analyzing the experiences I've had with the tactics in combat in D&D, both as a player and as a DM. Just how much control does a player even have determining the damage they take or whom the enemy chooses to attack. The first thing we should establish is that combat in D&D and video games work very differently. One of the primary differences is that in a video game, there's a mechanic often referred to as hate, threat, enmity, or aggro. Since there's no human being controlling the enemies the players are fighting against, instead the decisions of the enemies are programmed with an AI which determines who the enemy is more likely to attack. Set factors lead to the likelihood of enemy attacks against individual characters, and players can and do deliberately manipulate these factors to ensure the character they want attacked is, and the characters they do not want to be attacked aren't, or are at least less likely to be attacked. However, with D&D we have a DM controlling these enemies, and the DM isn't going to be as mechanically predictable as an AI. However, that doesn't mean we can't predict or influence DM decisions. If I'm faced with the exact same decision 10 times in a row as a DM, there's a good chance most or all of those 10 times I'm going to end up coming to the same decision. When a DM chooses who an enemy attacks and by what means they use to attack, they often use similar factors that we do as players. However, as a DM, there's a couple of factors that influence our tactical decisions that are different from the tactical decisions we make as players. Firstly, if you are a player, winning the combat isn't just important, it's generally something we assume is going to happen. Not that the player characters necessarily should win every combat. I think it's interesting to have some challenges where player characters need to come up with some other kind of solution, or even accept running away, but generally speaking, player characters normally win the combats. When you're a DM, it's just the opposite. So at least most of the time, as a DM, you aren't expecting to win the combat. So what I find is that as a DM, my goals change from when I'm a player. Instead of trying to win a combat, instead I'm trying to ensure the combat was challenging. Maybe force the characters to expend some resources. Maybe take some damage. This change in goals also changes my tactics. Now maybe we figure the enemy creatures start combat assuming they're going to win that combat, but even moderately intelligent creatures would be adjusting those expectations quickly enough after the typical first round of combat against seasoned PCs. Secondly, if I'm a player, I have a whole round of combat to consider carefully the actions of my character. When I'm a DM, I am constantly involved in everything that happens all while coordinating the actions of what is often many enemies at once. Decisions need to be made far more quickly and with less consideration. And that means that those decisions are going to be more simplistic. Thirdly, speaking of decisions being more simplistic, as a DM, the stakes just aren't the same as they are for player characters. Enemy creatures are going to die in combat. And if we make a tactical mistake and the enemy creature dies... It's just not that important to us as a player character dying. If I'm in a life and death scenario as a player, I'm willing to take extra time to consider every option to avoid that. As a DM, honestly, it's not worth slowing down gameplay at all to avoid the death of some monster the player characters were likely killing eventually anyways. Fourth, as a DM, it matters to my decisions how intelligent I consider the enemy to be. I'm going to try to run that dragon intelligently as I have time for, within the constraints that I've already mentioned. But if I'm running a black pudding or, or zombies, I mean, I'll forgo the tactics that are obviously better to employ tactics that are easier. 
these kinds of creatures just attack, you know, whatever's closest, because that's what I figure they would do, even if that's not the smart decision for them to make. Now, I've been discussing things I do differently in combat as a DM than I do as a player, but a lot of these things are universal in my experience. And as a player, I see DMs play with these same factors that I do again and again. So what this means is that as a player, we can absolutely make tactical builds and decisions to manipulate enemy attacks. But I want to stop right here and talk about in D&D, there is no built-in vulnerable character type. Even a moderately optimized character in pretty much any role can be pretty resilient. And what we tend to see in optimized tables are entire parties where every single character isn't defensively weak. And the stereotype that the wizard or the spellcasters in general are going to be more vulnerable to attacks is just an outright myth. In fact, probably the opposite is true. It's true that the non-casters and the half-casters in D&D tend to have more hit points, but it's the primary casters that can avoid damage far more effectively. If you want to focus on the highest armor class you can get, you're making a spellcaster. If you want the best solutions to avoid other kinds of damage, you're looking at spells. So it's not necessarily even needed to have a player character that is going to draw enemy attacks when every character is reasonably good at defense. But if we make a character that actively punishes attackers, well, then that changes. So where I want to finish here is I want to talk about the six ways as players we can manipulate enemy actions to ensure the enemies attack the player characters we want them to. Number one, damage. When I'm a DM and one player character is doing 30 damage around and another is doing 15, with all other things being equal, I'm having the enemy attack the one doing 30 damage. I mean, the incentive is obvious. Here's these two enemies attacking us, and one is ripping us apart. So naturally, that's the one we want to take out. Instinctually, it's the obvious move. Two enemies, one has a gun, one has a knife. If you have an opportunity to neutralize one of them, the decision is immediate. So what this means is, if you want the enemy to attack character A rather than character B, having character A deliver more damage is a big incentive. But this doesn't even necessarily mean that character A has to deliver more damage for the entire combat. As long as they start those first rounds delivering that damage, then they will be the primary target of the enemies. Number two advantage. As a player or as a DM, it is hard to ignore the incentive of attacking with advantage. If I'm the DM and I have two possible targets and I have advantage to attack one of them, then that's the one I'm attacking. Consider your own experiences. When that barbarian is raging and reckless attacking, the enemies just swarm them. Often the barbarian isn't even the most threatening if you consider spell casting, control effects, or even damage. And they're probably the worst target because they're likely to have resistance to the damage and they're always working off the highest hit points. Yet as a DM, I'm always inclined to take that advantage on attacks when it's right there to take. And it's not just me. I see in combat after combat, in campaign after campaign, and DM after DM, those enemies attack the enemy they have advantage to hit. As players, we can provide that advantage Actually, in many ways, maybe we are reckless attacking, but maybe we just fell prone. Speaking of which, if you have an enemy that can make ranged or melee attacks and you want them to attack you with a melee attack, falling prone is a huge incentive, providing advantage on attacks within five feet and disadvantage on ranged attacks. Number three, and this is along the same vein, disadvantage. Just like with advantage, disadvantage plays a huge factor as well. If the creature is going to have disadvantage to attack a player character, they'll choose another target if one is available, even if the target they have disadvantage against is a more important target. I see players fall for this too, often making terrible tactical decisions to avoid attacking with disadvantage. But DMs, it's like clockwork. We can cause disadvantage on enemy attacks in several ways. Some classes have it built in, like an armorer's thunder gauntlets, or an Ancestral Guardian Barbarian's Ancestral Protectors, or Cavalier's Unwavering Mark, but there are many ways to give enemies disadvantage against some targets and not others. The Blur Spell, the Dodge Action, Invisibility. 
Though there are some methods to impose disadvantage that aren't really going to impact enemy targeting decisions. For example, a light cleric can impose disadvantage on an attack with their warding flare ability, or a character with the protection combat style can impose disadvantage with that, or a battlemaster steel defender can impose disadvantage on an attack. But since that disadvantage isn't in play until after the enemy makes that decision on who to attack, then it's not really a discouragement. Though, if an enemy learns that the Steel Defender imposes disadvantage on attacks, but not against itself, that might incentivize attacks against them. Number 4. Armor Class I have fallen into this countless times as a DM. I have enemies attacking the character that's delivering the most damage, or is tactically the easiest to attack, and attack after attack is missing. Then I roll pretty well, like an 18 or a 19, plus the modifier, and the attack still misses because this character has the ability to boost their armor class to super high levels. Maybe they just cast a shield spell, and now I know I basically need a critical hit in order to hit at all. So what do I do? Well, I change targets. I figure it's better for the monster to do something than nothing. Number 5. Concentration. So let's say we have a bunch of werewolves and they're engaging in combat with the player characters. Then one of the player character's spellcasters casts a web spell, trapping several of those werewolves. Who are the rest of the werewolves likely to attack? You've got it, the one who cast the web. This makes a really smart target, because they don't even necessarily need to drop the spellcaster. They just need to drop the concentration. Then they're about to receive much needed reinforcements. Now, not all enemies necessarily know how concentration works, or even that dropping the spellcaster will remove the web. That will be for the DM to decide. And that's exactly what the DM is thinking about right now. Are these creatures smart enough to know that foregoing all other attackers to concentrate on the one concentrating on that web spell is the right decision, or aren't they? It can be even more pronounced. I think the flagship for drawing enemy attacks through concentration has got to be the Spirit Guardian spell. I mean, in terms of drawing enemy attacks, this is unrivaled. You're actively damaging the monsters. You're actively slowing down the monsters. And if they could only drop you, or at least drop your concentration, that would stop. It's like removing your hand from a hot stove. It is completely instinctual. Finally, and sixth, let's talk about convenience. Remember how I mentioned that DMs don't have much time to make combat decisions? Convenience is so important. So let's say we're fighting those werewolves. Here's a battle map. Who are those werewolves going to attack here? I mean, obviously, it's our frontliner. There's nobody else they could reach. Now, if I was a player and we were playing the werewolves, now maybe I have some time to think about some advanced tactics. Uh, maybe we could grapple that frontliner pull them out of the way, then the rest of us rush past. That might be a good tactical decision, but as a DM, it's far more likely I'm just going to attack the easy target. But let's say we're not attacking creatures with only melee options. Let's say it's orcs. Well, these orcs could throw javelins past our frontliner, though maybe those enemies in behind would have partial cover. Maybe they would be at long range, and the orc would have disadvantage. And that javelin just does less damage than the great axe. So it's just easier and more convenient to attack the frontliner with a melee attack. And that's likely what will happen. But let's say there isn't a choke point. Okay, so here we have the same orcs. Are they going to rush past our frontliner, maybe taking an opportunity attack, just to either need to dash or throw a javelin for less damage? Maybe. But if I'm the DM, probably not. Not unless you gave me a really good reason to do otherwise. And the following round is no different. Those orcs just have a constant reason to stay where they are, where they can make their best and most damaging attack with the least amount of effort. Convenience. Now, if nobody is up front, then it's different. Then dashing, or double dashing in this particular case, I guess, because they're orcs, is tempting. Or dashing and throwing javelins this turn and closing to melee next turn. But as soon as you have that player character up here, it all changes. I should probably talk here about grappling as well. Let's say we're attacking a tougher creature with both good melee and ranged options. Like here, we have a Cambion. They have a good melee and ranged attack. 
The ranged attack has a range of 120 feet, and there is no long range penalty. So our frontliner moves up and grapples them. What is their action going to be? Do they spend their action trying to escape, giving up their attacks? Do they attack the back line with ranged attacks with disadvantage because they're in melee, or do they attack the grappler with their melee attacks? I think their decision would likely be the same at every single table. They're attacking the one who grappled them. Why? Convenience. But what if the grappler had a good armor class? Lots of hit points. Wasn't doing as much damage. I don't think any of those things would change the decision. It's the grappler that's getting attacked because there's just a better chance that the Cambion's turn does something over nothing. So going back to the initial concept, let's say we have a character with armor of Agathis and we're wanting enemies to choose us for attacks and we want those attacks to be melee attacks. What can we do? Well, first and foremost, be in melee. If you want an enemy to use melee attacks, make those attacks the most convenient option. Secondly, don't be afraid to give those enemies advantage. An enemy is way more likely to select you as their target if they have advantage. Alternatively, or maybe in addition, give those enemies a disincentive to attack any other convenient target by imposing disadvantage. Don't be afraid to use or even potentially lose concentration. A concentrating player character is an attractive target to an enemy, especially if that concentration is hurting or hindering them, or both. Ensure you're delivering damage. An opponent that is delivering decent damage is way more enticing a target for enemies. And finally, don't present an impossible target. You have mirror images up, shield spells going off, in addition to your plate armor and shield. Well, those enemies, they're going to be actively looking for something they can actually hit over something that's probably just a waste of their attacks. So, if we take all these things, as well as those I mentioned in my last video, and then combine them to make a build that can make the most of the Armor of Agathis spell, I think it could be pretty effective. So, join me for that next time. Otherwise, until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.